You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Should companies be able to buy hundreds, if not thousands, of single family rentals? I'm Kathy Fetke, and welcome to The Real Well Show. This idea is getting a lot of pushback, or at least a little bit. Here's a headline that came out in Fast Company. A new bill proposes kicking Wall Street investors out of the U.S. housing market. But would it improve affordability? Well, I just got back from the IMN Single Family Rental Conference. That conference is filled with fund managers who own hundreds, if again, if not thousands of rental homes. And they would disagree with this. As you'll see in my interview today, I interview one of those fund managers or companies that owns over 5,000 rental properties. And we're going to find out what they have to say about it. But first, I'll just give a summary of this new bill. On Tuesday, U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley of Oregon and U.S. Representative Adam Smith of Washington introduced the, quote, End Hedge Fund Control of American Homes Act in both chambers of Congress seeking to push institutional investors out of the U.S. housing market. The bill aims to not only ban hedge funds from amassing large portfolios of single-family homes, but also to force them to sell off their current portfolio. Okay, I don't know if this is going to get much traction, but we are going to talk about it on The Real Wealth Show today. My guest today is Richard Ross, CEO of Quinn Residences, a real estate operating company focused on acquiring, developing, and operating dedicated rental communities in the southeast of the U.S., and he's here with us today on The Real Well Show. Richard, welcome. So you are in the build-to-rent space. How many properties do you have under um, management now? Current, well, we are an owner, operator, developer of dedicated rental communities currently with just over 5,200 homes and 39 communities. Um, southeast. Okay. Homes, you know, the Smile Belt. If southeast. You know. um, where specifically? Uh, Georgia, Florida, the Carolinas, Tennessee, um, for ne- for today. All, all the usual suspects. That's where we've been focused for years as well. It's an area that continues to grow and where the numbers still make sense. Are you currently in acquisition mode or building, building more build to rent? So we're always in acquisition mode, Kathy. Um, I would, I would tell you the business plan from inception has been to develop, acquire, own, and operate uh, as many homes as we can within our market so long as they make financial sense. And we've raised a considerable amount of equity, which allows us to do that. As I mentioned, we have just over 5,000 homes currently. But I I will say the last nine months to a year has been tough um, to make deals work financially, um, especially in the markets we're in, which are probably the best markets, I would say, in the United States, depending on who you talk to. Um, and the deals we've done, well, I'll put it in perspective. 2022, we did approximately 2,300 homes we purchased in roughly 14, 15 communities. This year to date, and the year is right, almost over, we bought 420 homes in four communities. And those are all ground up developments, meaning we bought the land and we're now developing the entire community. Got it. Okay. Wow. Now, how do you manage 5,000 homes? Well, initially when we started out, we used third party, two to three third party managers, um, because obviously to manage that number of homes, you need a platform, you need the infrastructure, you need the technology. Um, to make that a reality and do it well. And when you're just starting out, it's hard to do when you have 50 homes, 100 homes, even 1,000 homes. But over this past uh, six months to a year, we've begun what we call internalizing and building the platform, building the technology, building the back office, if you will, to be able to manage those homes effectively. And I would say by the end of March next year, we'll be fully internalized, meaning any third-party managers we used will will be let go and we'll manage all those homes ourselves. I'm a believer and have been for my entire real estate career that no one manages an asset better than the owner. Yeah, that's that's true. 
Okay. So, well, especially if you have that many, I imagine if you've got 10 or 20, it's a little bit easier to manage the managers, but when you scale to that level, uh, so you're not buying existing homes, you're, or are you? Well, we would, and we have in the past, right? We've done of these 5,000 approximate homes. Many of them have been where we've uh, bought communities from developers. You know, let's just take an example of a 150 home community and they're building out the community. We'll contract with them and buy eight to 12 homes a month as they deliver those homes. Um, What we call it certificate of occupancy or CO deals. Right. But those deals are few and far between in the last, let's say, year to 18 months. So we've had to continue um, to go up the scale, if you will, and buy um, buy land ourselves, entitled land. In other words, land that's permitted and work with our builder partners to build those communities out. Um, so not to say we wouldn't buy completed homes. And I think I think those opportunities are probably coming in in the middle of next year, as a lot of people who got into this space early are, are figuring out that the costs of financing uh, are very high and in most cases prohibitive for a small uh, operator who's who's doing one or two or three communities um, and has is trying to build and sell those. It really seems like it would be the opposite in terms of being able to find communities because it seems like builders uh, you know, are having a hard time selling, but maybe they're not. They're actually, sales have been up for builders, but I would think you could acquire more if you're coming in with cash uh, and, and take off some of that inventory from builders who aren't able to move it. Yeah. And, you know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting dynamic with home builders, right? In, in uh, before the pandemic, um, builders were more than willing to sell us homes at wholesale, entire community, right? Let's say a 10, 15% discount to retail, which is what they would sell to their usual customers. Then the pandemic hit, interest rates were still low. People wanted to get out of apartments, get out of close you know, quarters and home sales just shot through the roof as did their profit margins. Then of course, rates started to move up. Home prices started to increase kind of a double whammy. And um, it became tougher for them um, to sell homes. But what the big builders have been doing, and I'm talking the big public builders, have been buying down mortgages, let's say, for the last six to nine months. Meaning if a mortgage rate is seven, they'll say, hey, buyer, we'll give you a four and a half percent mortgage. And it's just a math, right? They pay the lender to get the rate from seven to four and a half, whatever that number is, it varies. And then a buyer feels more uh, comfortable buying that loan. I, I'm not sure how long they can continue to do that, obviously, but that's what they've been doing sort of to keep their machine going, right? Um, at some point that parade will end and builders will have to come back to people like Quinn and other built to rent um, to keep their machines going. Got it. Yeah. And so for for funds like yours, I mean, is, is that what you would call it? A fund or a No, I would I would no. call us an an operating platform. In other words, we are okay. funded by institutional, large institutional investors. Um, but the goal for us is not to get in and get out. We are a long term owner of these communities. Um, and we are, are you Okay. And are you dependent on financing today with today's rates or are you just paying yes, cash? Absolutely. Um, we, okay. we, we have a certain amount of equity, right. And typically in real estate and, and certainly at our company, a prudent, we'll put a prudent amount of leverage. Let's just hypothetically say if a home's $300,000, we'll invest a hundred thousand of equity, not unlike a right 30, a third, not unlike a home buyer. And we'll go get a mortgage, if you will, or a loan for two thirds of that. And we have that capability today. Obviously it's a lot more expensive today than it was a year, 18 months ago. Absolutely. I mean, that's, I can't even imagine it being able to pencil unless you have a much lower LTV. I mean, how are you making that work? Well, again, it's tough. As I mentioned, we've done four projects in this last year Mm -hmm. and how we're making it work is um, we're obviously getting in earlier, so we're buying the land 
um, that's entitled, we're doing the horizontal work, right? So we're creating the lots, if you will. Then we're hiring a builder. One of Some of these are big public builders. Some are regional builders that build the home for us. And then um, we put it on our leasing platform and lease it. So how, how do they work? Um, when you get involved earlier, there's a little bit more um, opportunity there for the numbers to work. We have very good financing. Um, our platform, as I mentioned, is, is allows us to keep our profit margins, if you will, our operating margins um, fairly good in this environment. Uh, scale helps. So 5,000 homes is better than 1,000. 10,000 would be better than 5,000, obviously. Um, so that helps. And then we believe long term, the financing, and, and you've started to see that sort of the long term interest rates will come back. They'll I don't believe they'll ever go back to where they were three years ago, right, where the money was essentially free or even a long-term loan was 3% or something like that. But on a U.S. 10-year treasury of four and a half, we can make that work um, with the, the properties we're looking at today, especially given sort of the demand dynamics that are going on in, in the dedicated rental community space. Well, and let's talk about that demand. What are you seeing out there? So we're still seeing very robust demand in our markets, right? Southeast. Um, and that's driven by several things. The basic things, forget the current economic environment, are the growth in, in the population, um, the aging of the population, right? Millennials are aging, Gen Zs, everybody's aging and wanting to get out of sort of that first apartment. Um, there's a huge shortage of homes in this country, huge, depending on who you talk to, anywhere between four and six million. So there's a supply shortage. Demand has gone up. Um, and that has really driven from day one the business, our business and many others who are in this business. Then you couple that with an increase in home prices of, uh, I forget the statistics, but 20, 30% over the last couple of years. And mortgage rates going from three and a half, let's just say to seven, so doubling. And that creates a very interesting dynamic on rental. Um, obviously, uh, we're paying more for the home, so we have to get more rent for the home to make, to make the economics work for us as an investor. But we're still somewhere between, well, at, at, in our company, we're about 45% cheaper than owning. So you take a starter home, which is sort of the, the place we play, $350,000 starter home in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, all in, we're about 45 to 50% less to own that home per month than, I'm sorry, to rent that home from us than to buy it. And that's because mm. of interest rates. That's become a home yeah. price appreciation. And that includes maintenance and property taxes and insurance, which obviously now insurance is, is another issue we've seen in this inflationary times. So all of those things lead to um, increased demand for our product. There is a big pushback right now against funds or against um, companies that own rental properties in, in mass. I think there was a very false article that's been passed around this past week with something saying something like 44% of all homes purchased are uh, hedge funds from New York. It's completely false, not even close. Do you have any idea what the percentage is of, of funds and, and companies like yours buying? Yeah, it's fascinating, this um, this dynamic that's going on in political circles and in, in, in the media about the evil landlord big landlord yeah. owners. The, the facts are different. Um, in 2023, so let's take the year that's about to end, about 2.5% of rentals were bought by, by rental people. People who own 1,000 plus homes, so people like us, only bought 0.3% of those of, of homes for wow. People with a hundred uh, in the hundred to a thousand, so a smallish investor, less than one percent, still 07 percent. Uh, an investor who owns ten to one hundred ninety nine homes, about two point seven percent. The largest twenty percent of those rental home purchases were done by people who own less than ten homes. So mom, mom and pop, pop if you, yeah, yeah, mom and pop investors who, by the way 
own about 98% of all rental homes in this country. So this, this sort of narrative that institutions own, you know, well, like you said, that article that said they bought 44, it's just not true. Today, single family rentals are about, well, let me just back up. In the U.S. today, there's approximately 132 million households, occupied households. So that's you, me, we're, you know, a household. Of those 132 million, a little over a third or 45 million are rentals, all kinds. That could be mobile homes, that could be apartments, that, that also includes single family rentals. Of that 45 million, 14 and a half million are single family rentals. So these big institutions. But what's fascinating is of all of that, only three, less than 4% are owned by large institutions that these articles and this media. So less than 4% of the rental homes in this country are owned by big institutions. It's primarily, and always has been for the last 50 years, a mom and pop business. Just to put a fine, a really in, in our space, right? Brand new, dedicated, built to rent communities. As of the end of 23, I think there'll be under 200,000 homes out of, out of a total of 45 million rentals. So it's just minuscule. Now, over the next 10 years, will that grow? I certainly hope so. And I think we as a country need it to grow because that 4 million shortage or 6 million shortage of households, those people, those houses, households are being formed. Those people need places to live. Yeah. And like you said, it's, it's cheaper today to rent than to own. Um, what did you say? 45% cheaper to, yeah. for people to rent your home than if they were to buy yeah, it and historically, historically, and we're talking like 50 years since World War II, renting's always been about 15 to 18% cheaper than owning, right? Because the, the landlord has done the initial investment. In essence, the down payment on the rental. That 15% has now tripled to 45%. So it's very compelling, especially for folks like us, who give people a brand new home, you know, granite countertops, stainless steel appliances, uh, a technology package, all the things that young homeowner, home dwellers, I should say, are looking for. Um, and yet at a 45% discount to, to buying that home from one of the large builders. Yeah, that's, that's what so many of these people don't understand when they write articles or uh, put out bills to try to squash uh, these rental homes from happening. I don't, I don't know if you saw that, but here's a, from a quote. It's a headline, new bill seeks to limit how many houses investors and hedge funds can purchase. So, you know, it's like the landlord's the bad guy, and yet you're providing, and we are providing housing that maybe that person doesn't want to own. Maybe they just want to live there and they're happy to rent, but somehow this is being attacked. So what are your thoughts on this new le legislation? Well, it's interesting. Well, the, the new legislation, I think, is, I, I mean, I, I won't get into the politics. I think they're pandering to to um, an, an election year, frankly, and this all this uh, media attention of you know home prices going up, which they are, and the unaffordability, which it is for sure, you know very hard for a young couple or 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 um, partnership to to buy a starter home, three hundred and fifty four hundred thousand dollars starter home, very difficult. That's really due to supply. I mean, we have not built enough homes in this country since the great financial crisis. So in the last fifteen years, just to not put two full. Uh, to find a point in 2023, through the third quarter, so through September, there were a million eight households formed. And a household is just either a couple or somebody who, a young you know, kid who wants to get out of mom and dad's house. So a million eight households were formed. We only started a million four homes in that period. So not only is this four to six million shortage big, it's getting bigger. Like we're still not building enough homes. So obviously supply is an issue. Now, what we're also learning in our business is the perception and the, the desire that most of our residents have may not be to own a home. Now, we have enough now data to show that about a third of our residents rent from us because they can't afford a home and eventually they want to buy one. So they're saving for a down payment. Maybe they're waiting for mom and dad to help them. 
But that means two thirds of our residents aren't in the market to buy a home. And who are they? Half of them are renters, what I call renters by choice. People who say, you know, I might want to live on Raleigh for the next three or four years, but I might get transferred to Denver or I might have to go to Dallas. And why would I put my down payment, put all of this equity in a house when I, I need to be mobile, right? And then the other segment of that is actually 55 and older folks who maybe they've sold, the kids are out of the house, maybe they've sold their home at these prices, they pocketed some cash, and they want that sort of low ma no maintenance lifestyle, which dedicated rental communities, I don't have to mow the lawn, the toilet gets stopped up, right? I go on my app, I, I say, um, uh, you know, come fix the toilet, and they come fix the toilet. So I, I think it's a supply problem, but I also think the quote unquote American dream has changed a little bit. And I don't know that I'm going to say something that, that some of these people who have been in Congress for 50 or 60 years understand the dynamic. Yeah, well said. Uh, you know what? I mean, I don't think it's going to pass. I, I, it's not the first time this has come up. And when people really get the facts, and hopefully they're getting them now and, and can spread the word, uh, they would see that rentals are needed and the build to rent space is a, is not competing necessarily. Uh, it, it's providing new inventory to help solve the crisis. The more inventory that comes on, well, then, you know, that, that can generally keep price, not prices down, but rents down. When there's not enough place for people to live and the demand is strong, of course, rents go up. And prices go up. So it's really a service, but how do you get the information out there? I mean, what kind of pushback is there against this kind of legislation? Well, it's, 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 well, podcasts like this, Kathy, and, and <laughs> I, I have spent a considerable amount of time in communities, right? Um, literally at a city council meeting because we're building a potential community in their community, in their jurisdiction and they're like we don't want renters there's always this bias yeah. against renters because they're cooking meth in the backyard or they're not gonna they're gonna let the homes run down or whatever and once which is sometimes true <laughs> which is sometimes true no doubt yeah. but once you sh once you show these uh, uh city council members homeowners association presidents whatever what institutional ownership, large owners of rental communities, and how it differs from a, a for sale subdivision, how we maintain our homes, we pay our property taxes on time, the lawns are all mowed, we're not going to let the shingles fall off the roof. And in a for sale community, right, let's just take a, a, a for sale community of 200 home, starter homes, after a couple of years, right, people might resell their home and that might be sold to uh, a mom and pop renter or, or someone less than desirable for the neighborhood. And so you can ride down those streets and see maybe every fifth or sixth home is in a little bit in disrepair. Institutional, we can't rent a home that looks like it's falling apart where the lawn isn't mowed. So we maintain our homes and, and want to hold on to them for a long, for the long haul. So it's a slow process. It's a very local process where we could use um, help is, and we have an industry group that's doing this, is putting out, you know, good articles that explain the truth. First of all, like you mentioned about the statistics, but also show how the dream of owning a home may not be everybody's dream anymore, like it was in the 1950s and 60s, and how adding a different uh, option for people to live, have a roof over their heads, is something that benefits everybody. I mean, it's kind of back in, in the day when, when car leasing first came out. It was sort of this weird, you mean I can lease a car and then give it back up for 10 years? <laughs> Yeah. But now it's just a different way of owning a car, right? You, you look at the lease and you look at the buy and you make a decision, financial decision, which is better for me. It's the same thing yeah. with rental communities. I'm still a proponent of buying a car because I'll drive it till the end. But uh, yeah, if you want a nice new car every three years, leasing's the way to go. 
All right. Well, Richard, thank you so much for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. Any final thoughts for our audience? No, I would just say, um, Kathy, to all of those investors out there, you know, if you're, if you're diligent and you're looking for um, communities, um, rents always adjust. And so I know it's, it's, it's difficult today with the high financial rates, but long term, um, the dedicated rental community or build to rent um, single family rentals is a very attractive investment. And some of you may know I'm a fund manager as well. We're focused on the North Dallas area. If you're interested in finding out how you can invest in real estate without actually having to do the work yourself, just invest. We do the acquisition, renovation, and management of those properties in a super high growth area of Texas where the new chip manufacturing is coming in. Just go to realwealth.com, click on the invest tab, and you'll see a drop down for our syndications, or you could just go to growdevelopments.com. Uh, we're still accepting investment until I think the beginning of February. So it's about a month or so. If you're still interested, you do have to be accredited in order to invest. You can find out what an accredited investor is by going to our website at realwealth.com or also just Googling accredited investor uh, SEC and you'll go to the SEC website and it will tell you. Basically, you need to be making $200,000 as an individual or $300,000 if you're married or have a million dollar net worth, excluding your home residence. That's kind of the basic overview. Or you have a license and a securities license. And if you'd like to find out how to build your own real estate portfolio, just go to realwealth.com. You'll get hundreds of free webinars to help you on your journey. And you can speak with one of our investment counselors who are really experienced in real estate, have bought with many of the teams that we refer to at Real Wealth and have become job optional. But thankfully, they're opting to have a job still with Real Wealth because they love talking to you and helping you build your portfolio. So again, you can go to realwealthshow.com, join for free, and you'll get access to all those free services. I'm Kathy Fedke. Thanks for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. We'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.